Hi, I'm Peter Rose, founder of Longwood Currency Trading. I want to talk to you today about the probabilities of Forex trading. Why am I standing in front of this massive snow pile? Because that's a probability that uh, an event was not supposed to happen, but it did. The other day I was doing a video uh, and we were out in the yard and, and there, was no, um, there was no snow out there at all in the yard and I was saying well you know I'm getting ready there was a big storm coming and uh, we we're expecting six to, eight, six to eight inches and the snow that I had talked about in the previous storm had got to 14 and a half inches and um, I was saying you know um, though we're only expected to get six to eight I, I part of my DNA is to look at the worst case scenario situation and prepare for that and then I got cold and and we came inside. Go back and look at that video. Um, well, it turned out that this is that storm that I was talking about. And here we have, if you remember from that last video, where there was grass out there, there's now about 14 inches of snow again, because the last storm we got was uh, pretty, pretty, pretty big. It was uh, 12 inches anyway. And uh, in many places out there, we're, we're, we're probably 14 inches of snow. And we're expecting 8 inches more. So the, the probability that the weather folks had talked about uh, for that last storm, that 6 to 8 inches or 4 to 6 or whatever, was drastically underestimated. And, you know, when we look at trading, um, we look at a position, we look at price action, and we say, huh, you know, I think this is going to go up. Well, yeah, but what do you base that on? You know, the hairs on your back or the, you know, I, it's Tuesday. What, what, do you, what, do you, what do you base that on? Well, you're basing it on the probability of your experience being correct. Well, what if you don't have any experience? Well, then you have to know a little bit of math. And this is something that I work with um, with a lot of the folks that I, that I talk with is trying to simplify the math of probability to, to stuff that's just really basic and understandable because it can get really complex. And my feeling is that when you allow the math to get really complex, um, you're complicating the situation. You're complicating your thought process. You really have to whittle things down to their simplest components. Take your best guesstimate of that and, uh, and go on from there. You have to. In, um, oh, and, you know, I mean, I've got a BS in physics, almost a minor in math, and so I've d done a lot of, listened to a lot of lectures on this type of stuff. And in... Um, the experience of the mathematics tells you that if you get, if you get, uh, you don't have to get a hundred percent of the of the problem solved in order to to reach a result that is well good enough is a bad you know that's a, well that's good enough that it is good enough. Um, if you're familiar at all with uh, mathematics, you know about Taylor expansions and things like that. They're just solutions like an equation. And you go, oh, here's a thing that you solve and you add to that another thing that you solve to get a greater accuracy. Accuracy is stuff that goes on beyond the decimal point. You know, I saw 1.2435679372.51. Well, when you're out to 251, does it really make any difference to, to tell you how fast your car is going? You know. <laughs> you don't need any decimal points. You don't need, oh, I'm going 67.3 miles an hour. Uh, it's not really relevant, right? And so <clears throat> that's what the, the quants are doing in looking at the markets, is they're looking at those far out decimal values over thousands and thousands and thousands of iterations because at some point, something out at the sixth or eighth decimal point is going to magnify itself and bubble itself up to significance. You know, I was a software engineer for <clears throat> 33 years doing business applications development. 
and uh, you would do calculations over, you know, for example, I was doing, I was doing some programming for a company that was writing reservations, uh, bookings and reservation software for airlines. And so you're dealing with thousands and thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of dollars a day of, of income from all kinds of different uh, sources. And that income is, you know, this is going to end up at $42.85 and the next thing is going to be $285.45. And those 45 cents and 28 cents, if you add all those up, you constantly get more and more decimal places out at the end as, the, as you get more data, right? And so at the end of the day, do you want to tell a customer that his ticket is going to be $385 and cents. No, you know, you're $385 and 35 cents and that call it a day. You don't need 35, you don't need 0.358 cents. <laughs> if you want to do that, you call it 36 cents. So you're looking at the price action you have to look at the price action in the same way when you're looking at whether you're going to take a trade or not because um, that's really a probabilistic es estimation of the viability that price action will continue in an upward direction if you're looking to go long. And that, it's, it, that's, that's what it is. Now you could look at the thing and say, well, if the sun is rising and the price is rising, the, sun, the price is still going to rise because the sun, I, I mean, all the crazy shit that you, that, that, that you see, or the Fibonacci numbers, that kills me. The guys that are out there, oh, well, you know, this confirms it certainly looks like, a, uh, you know, it's gone through the, uh, the 68 uh, level and so that means it's going to go to the next fib. I, I, why? What the hell does that have to do with the order flow and the execution that's going on? I mean, the fact that it ends up, perhaps, respecting that 68 level means absolutely nothing from a predictive standpoint. That's just how it ended up. This snow pile out here is probably six, seven feet tall, right? And uh, um, how do you predict that? when the snow is coming down. Oh, I think by the time the snow plow gets done and blah, 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 this is going to be seven feet tall. <laughs> no, it's, it's going to be a lot of snow. <laughs> that's all you can do. But the critical thing is that <clears throat> because of the amount of snow that's coming down, I can say, man, we're going to have a lot of snow on the ground. In fact, that's what the snow plow guy uh, and I talked about the other day when he piled the st stuff all up. He said, well, I had to push off the driveway because there's another storm coming and I knew that this storm was going to continue on and so I had to push it far enough off so we had room to push the next snow off. Okay, so there's a, uh, an action that he took that was a probabilistic estimation based on the data that he had at th in real time that th that's what he needed to do. And it turned out that that's what he needed to do. Now, what if the storm wasn't 14 inches of snow? What if it was only six? Then he would, would not have necessarily had to have pushed the snow all the way over there. Did it hurt to push the snow all the way over there? No, because there'll be another storm. So that's where your win to loss ratio comes in. You make these probabilistic estimations of the success of your trade. If you're not doing that, you shouldn't be taking a trade. Just because a fib number is right or some friggin' moving average crosses over another moving average. I, it's just stupid. It's just crazy the way people are talking about this stuff. Regardless, let's just say you have some methodology that you determine that from a probabilistic standpoint, you, uh, the price will continue to go up and so you, you should take that trade. And it doesn't work out. Uh, it's, okay, well, the same scenario comes up. And you go, well, I'll take the trade. And it doesn't work out. And you uh, take a look at the next situation. Say, well, it looks like it should go up. But it doesn't go up. And so you go, fuck this. I'm not going to, I'm not going to use this system. That's where you get into trouble. Because you don't have confidence in your methodology. You don't have confidence in your system. If you have confidence in your system, you have, to, you have to stay with it. You have to keep doing it. 
if it's the right system, eventually the statistics will work out. And that's where you get a win to loss ratio. You're a 60 40 trader. It means that over a lot, large sample size of trades, if you trade 100 times, 60 of them are going to be winners <coughs> and 40 of them are going to be losers. So if you're at the 20th trade and you've lost, is it your methodology that's wrong? Or are you just caught in the anomaly of hitting all those losers in a row? Well, I think from a statistical standpoint, if you do something and it's incorrect six times in a row, you better take a look at your, at your methodology. Because generally the distributions of wins and losses don't coalesce in a short time frame. You don't get six winners and then four losing runners. Um, you don't get four losses or five losses and then go on to a, a win streak. From a probabilistic standpoint, if you had four losses in a row and you were a 60-40 trader, you probably would figure that you're due for some winners because you had some coalescing there. But the coalescing, the packing of the, of the probabilities, usually, that's, that's, a, that's a rare event. In a 100 trades, you may coalesce 5% of the time, 8% of the time. So you don't base your methodology on waiting for the coalesce of your <laughs> of your statistics. <laughs> okay? You don't have to be a math wizard to do this. Um, I try to simplify things to make it make sense so that you don't have to do any calculations. The only calculations that you're going to need to do is as you're trading and you've got 50 or 60 trades, What's your win to loss ratio at that point? After you get 100 trades, what's your win to loss? Is it different than the one at 50 or 60? I mean, who's to say? You may be very consistent in your trading and, and after, after your first 20 trades, you're gonna trade the same forever. You just lucked on to the methodology that works for you and a methodology that supports your emotional uh, character, I guess, is how you'd call it. So when, when we're looking at, at these types of, of probabilistic evaluations of price action, you have to have somebody to kind of, I don't know, give you the confidence that, that they can trust the probabilities. You know, uh, somebody could say, um, well, I'm not going to wear a seatbelt because I haven't been, I haven't been, I've never been in a car accident. Well, from a probabilistic standpoint, you've driven the car a thousand hours, let's say, and you've never even had a, a quick stop. And so you could say, well, I guess the chances of me running into a problem with uh, wearing a seatbelt, this is not there. And... You can go ahead and feel that way. I, I drove, uh, I was, uh, oh, I don't know, I guess I was 28, 27 years old and had driven since I was 16. So a long time, right? Never had a, never had a, a, a quick stop, never had a crash, never had anybody hit me, never, you know, was always very careful, but always wore my seatbelt. And one day I'm in town and driving down the road and this person, blew the stop sign and plowed right into the side of my car and uh, my head knocked out knock, uh, knocked uh, hit the window and knocked that out screwed my back up for life and um if i wouldn't have had my seatbelt on i could very well have been uh killed so you have to look at the at the planet killer events um not putting a stop on, that's a planet killer. Cause you'll go to sleep at night and then you wake up at seven o'clock in the morning and take a look and you've been, and you've been margined out. Um, that's not the kind of thing that you do a probabilistic analysis of. <laughs> you just look at the wor worst case scenario and you go, nah, I don't, I don't even wanna look at the worst case scenario. That's why I, when I'm, 
talking to folks about trading and, 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 and they say, oh, there's too much noise day trading and what can you do in two hours? Well, you know, if you can't do it in two hours, what, you're gonna sit there for 20 hours and do it? Really? Because of the fractal nature of price, in other words, it's like a leaf. You look at the edge of the leaf and then you cut that down and it looks the same down lo lower and then you cut that back and it, you, or the coastline. You know, you look at it way up high and you have all these craggly inputs and stuff and you come real close to the, and you craggly things and then you get down. So you're looking at the ground and you have all that stuff. It's, it, that's fractal, right? Um, price action is fractal. It doesn't matter whether you're looking at a one minute chart or a, a daily chart. The squiggles on the chart's gonna be the same. You can't tell the difference between an hour and a daily chart if you take the axis off, right? And so, if you're going to trade, um, and you wanna be a day trader, you're not gonna be able to do that on the daily chart. Because <laughs> you'll be there all day. <laughs> you'll be there all week, 24 seven, right? Um, you have to reasonably look at the time you have available for trading and work on your trading plan. And what does that plan call for? And what are the things that you need to look out for that are planet killers, account killers, and prevent that from happening? And then you have to have an idea of the probability that are involved in calculating your win to loss ratio, your average win value, uh, and those two are intimately c correlated, right? If you're a 60-40 trader, and when you win the 60 times, you win $5, but on the 40 times that you lose, you lose $100 each time, uh, it's not gonna work out too good for you, right? So the average win value is important. If you have a good win to loss, but you're still losing, it means that there's an anomaly in your uh, trading methodology, somebody needs to take a look at that and say, hey, you know, you're not getting the full bang for your buck and here's a couple of reasons why and here's some solutions for you. Sometimes it's really hard for us as individuals to look at our own shit and, and say, oh yeah, I'm being really stupid here. I mean, if you thought you were stupid, you wouldn't go into trading in the first place. So it's really hard to pick out when you're doing stupid shit. It really is. I do stupid shit all the time. I don't have anybody look at my stuff, but I don't need to because when the when it when it ends up hitting my bank hard, and I'm not trading mini lots, so it's a pizza that I'm losing. It could be it could be a really large amount of money. I can look at that and go, "Whoa, I don't want that to happen again." And if it does happen again, I'm going to say, "Well, you know, I got an issue." As in the last video that I just did talking about, I'm pushing my trading too hard. I, I, I recognize that after a couple of very significant losses. And so um, that's the kind of critical analysis that you have to uh, undertake in looking at your trading and looking at the statistics and having some vague idea of how to look at the Forex market as a probabilistic stew of price action that if you can figure out um, certain things about how price moves, you have to understand why price is moving. You can't just say, well, it jiggles around on the chart and at five o'clock when everybody goes home, the price flatlines. That's just not gonna make it. It's a market, it's order flow, right? And you kind of have to understand the, the principles behind that so you understand the principles of little squiggly lines that are coming out on the chart. And then you pick a time frame. And you say, okay, what's reasonable? How many pips is reasonable for this thing to move before it flips around and does a retracement? Because don't forget, a, a, a reversal or a retracement can turn into a swing. And you, if you're holding on, you could go, you could go to, the, to the wood on that. So, yes, you know, people talk about all the work that they do and blah, 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 blah. You know... Um, you can work hard or you can work smart. I don't want to work hard. As a software engineer, I don't want to work hard. I want to work smart. I want to step back from the problem. People give me these really complicated problems to solve. You can't just jump into it and start banging away and working and thinking you're going to work 60-hour weeks and get the thing done. 
because it'll be a spaghetti mess. You won't be able to figure out what you did. There's a lot of times in my career where all I've done is walk around the facility with a cup of coffee in my hand thinking. A lot of times I've left the building and gone outside and, and, and sat on a curbstone or in the grass or something and thought, what, what is the problem? Where's the, what am I really trying to solve here? Am I just trying to put a bunch of code down or is, I, am, is there a problem I'm trying to solve that I can extrapolate out of that particular area of the, of the uh, um, program that I'm working on and focus on that and then see how I can tie that to, to another piece and then hook those together, solve them individually and then hook them together. And our trading, when you approach the trading at a, as a probabilistic problem to solve, I think the solutions become easier to determine, not the solution itself, but the solution path becomes easier to determine. And when you gain experience, you go, wait a minute, there's only like four things that can happen in the whole course of the life cycle of the trade, from entry analysis to position management through exit methodology. There's only about four things that are going to happen over two major types of, of price action. So do I have eight rules or, or can I condense those into four? If I could condense them into four, I'm... I'm, I'm having a lot easier time. Those are the thought processes that you need to go through, and that's the work of trading. The thing is that you don't have to do that every day. You sit down when you're starting to trade, you get a little experience trading some mini lots, and you work through those problems. I mean, that's what my instruction does. I'm not teaching you anything new. There's nothing new to teach you. It's how to use your thoughts and how to organize them and how to put them together. But that's why it's more expensive than anybody else, because I have to work with you. I can't just throw a book at you and say, here, read this, and you'll have the secrets of trading. If you think that's what's going to happen, well, don't send me an email because I can't help you. You know, I wish I could, but I can't. Um, and I'm not going to waste my time on you <laughs> just because I, even if you wanted to pay me money, I'm not going to waste my time because I'm retired. <laughs> why would I waste my time with somebody that's not going to be successful? And then you're going to bitch. Well, some bitch charged me thousands of dollars and it didn't work. <laughs> no, asshole. It didn't work because you didn't know what you're doing. You didn't want to do the work. So um, I learned this stuff the hard way through uh, 40 years of real estate investment, 33 years as a software engineer. I've been in the martial arts for 55 years. Um, I've been around the block. And early on, because I was interested in so many things, Early on, I realized I could get mired in the mud if I tried to learn everything. So what do I need to learn? How do I need to do it? You know, Tim Ferriss is a, is a master at that. Extrapolate out the key nodes that you need to do and solve those, and you've got 80% of the problem solved by knowing 20% of what you need to do. Really, it's as easy as that. Peter Rose, Longwood Currency Trading. Have a great day and have a great trading day, because I'm cold. And I'm heading inside.